Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class. Today I'd like to tell you about how this triangle of numbers secretly has this fractal hiding inside it. We're gonna begin by seeing what's up with that triangular fractal shape. And first let's ask, what is a fractal? There are many types of fractal, but the most common type is a geometric object where if you zoom into it, there are an infinite amount of different scales that continue to have detail and complexity. And some of the most popular fractals have a trait known as self-similarity, where smaller zoomed in portions of a fractal may resemble larger zoomed out portions of itself. Here's a vegetable that has a lot of self-similarity in a sort of fractal-like way. And although the pattern here doesn't continue infinitely inward, we can see this sort of like an approximation of some fractal. And similarly, although I wouldn't be able to draw the fractal that we're going to be discussing today, it has infinite complexity inside it after all, I can draw a series of a approximations, and these approximations will approach the true fractal as a limit. Here's what we're going to do. We start with an equilateral triangle, and imagine it being subdivided into four smaller equilateral triangles, each of which have a side length half as big as the original, and we remove the middle of those triangles, leaving just three smaller equilateral triangles left. And we're going to repeat the process. Now taking each of those triangles, imagine subdividing them into four even smaller triangles and removing the central one. And we're going to iterate this process at each stage, looking at whichever triangles are left and removing some smaller central triangle from each of them. Here's what we would get from the first few iterations of that process, and the true fractal we're talking about, Sierpinski's triangle, is the limit of this. It's what we would get if we could iterate this process an infinite amount of times. Now, if we look at the approximation we get from some finite amount of iterations and compare it to the previous approximation, we can note some traits that the final fractal has compared to itself. Like each approximation could be seen as the previous approximation with some more triangular holes cut out of it, or could be seen as three shrunken copies of the previous approximation stacked together. And we can see the final fractal as three shrunken copies of itself together. And each of those little copies are composed of three even smaller copies of the whole thing and etc. And this infinite nature gives it some strange properties. For example, the limit of the area of this shape approaches zero, but some points never disappear, so there's still some structure there. And if we look at what dimension we would call this shape, although it may look obviously two-dimensional, normally, if we take a shape in a given dimension and double how long one of the sides is, the size of the result will be two to the power of the dimension times as big, like doubling the side length of a 2D square results in something 2 to the second power times as big, or doubling the side length of a 3D cube results in something with 2 to the third power of the size of the original. And in this case, if we double the side length of the fractal, we would end up with three copies of itself. And based on the typical calculations, that would result in a dimension between one and two. And it's actually true that under some classifications, this shape can be considered approximately one and a half dimensional. Now let's set aside that geometric triangle for a moment to take a look at a seemingly unrelated triangle of numbers known as Pascal's triangle. 
Now, there are many ways we could generate these numbers. For example, one of the ways that we could create or define Pascal's triangle is as an array of the coefficients we get in a binomial expansion. Meaning that if we take an expression like a plus b raised to different powers and just look at the coefficients of the result, those are the numbers in Pascal's triangle. And there are many mathematical patterns that end up leading to Pascal's triangle, but let's create it with my favorite method. Now this treats the outside of Pascal's triangle as being an infinite amount of zeros. So if you just want the non-zero digits, you could do this process and then ignore all the zeros that will show up. But what we're going to do is take an infinite sequence of numbers in a row that contains a one with an infinite amount of zeros on each side, and then we're going to create another sequence that's slightly offset so that each term in this new sequence is between and below two terms of the previous sequence, and we're going to generate the new terms by adding up whatever two terms are above them. Like zero next to zero adds to a zero between and beneath those, but zero next to one adds up to a one beneath that. And if we continue this process with more lines following the exact same rule where each number number is the sum of two terms above it, we then get a 1 plus 1 equals 2, and other numbers that show up. And if we continue this infinitely, and sometimes ignore all the zeros depending how you're defining things, we get Pascal's triangle. Now here's how most people would write the top of Pascal's triangle, just the non-zero digits of it. And before we look at its geometric connection with a fractal, let's look at a few of the numerous connections that this has with other sequences of numbers. For example, if I take each of these horizontal rows and add up each component in them, I get 1, 2, 4, 8, 8, 16, and the rest of the powers of 2. If I add up slightly more diagonal crooked lines, looking at sort of skewed diagonals like this, the sums are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and the rest of the Fibonacci numbers. If I look at more direct diagonals, we get one that's only full of the number one, one that's the whole numbers going up, and then the triangular numbers, the tetrahedral numbers, the 4D version of triangular numbers and further dimensions. And in general, I like to nickname Pascal's triangle, the triangle of hyper triangles, because it sort of encodes all of the different dimensions you could look at triangular numbers in. And as we're about to see, that's not the only way that other triangles are hidden within this triangle. Now to bring that fractal back into the mix, we're going to look at Pascal's triangle, but just analyze whether each number is even or odd. We could do this by taking sectors of Pascal's triangle that we calculate normally and then translating them into evens versus odds, but I prefer a method where we're going to recreate the triangle using almost exactly the same rules as before. If we start with another sequence that's a one with an endless amount of zeros on each side of it and then generate new sequences such that each term is the sum of the two numbers above it, but this time we make one plus one equals zero, that will end up falling into the arithmetic patterns of what's called mod two, and will end up generating a version of Pascal's triangle that's equivalent to if we took the normal triangle and then translated it into zeros for evens and ones for odds. So here's the top of what we'd get. 
And do you notice anything visually here? Like maybe a larger triangle made of ones with a zero in the middle of it? Or maybe a few smaller triangles made of ones? Well, let's zoom a little further to see what might be going on. And at this point, a lot of you can probably see there's something or another triangular going on. But what exactly? Well, to make it clearer, we could take this, put it on some sort of grid, and color code it. Now, to put this type of array of numbers on a grid, where they're in cells that come in rows, but each cell has two cells above it, a hexagonal grid turns out to be the perfect fit. So here's the top of the Mod 2 version of Pascal's triangle on a hexagonal grid, and let's color code it so the ones become black filled in cells and the zeros become white empty cells. To note, we could make this same pattern with an alternate rule just based on the colors, where we could start with a hexagonal grid, fill in one cell black, and all cells beneath that are either white if the two cells above them are the same color, or black if the two cells above them are different colors. Whether we create this with a rule about colors or with mod 2 arithmetic, as we go further, it resembles some triangular things we saw earlier. At this point, it looks pretty similar to the third iteration approximation of Sierpinski's triangle we saw earlier, and now I'm going to remove the hexagonal grid behind it and go a little further, and at this point, it looks kind of like the fourth iteration approximation of that. And if you look deeper and deeper, you'll find sections of this that look like further and further approximations in that process of creating Sierpinski's triangle. And not only will this resemble further and further iterations of that, but it'll also become closer looking to whatever approximation you can see in it. Because as you get to bigger and bigger scales, all the small details like the hexagonal cells and the fact that the interior missing triangles don't quite touch the sides become so small you can't even see them. Eventually, it would become indistinguishable to the human eye whether you were looking at a triangular thing that was generated from one of these processes or the other. And beyond what humans can see, Pascal's triangle and Sierpinski's triangle exist as limits of patterns. They are infinite things, each in their own way. Pascal's triangle being infinite in a downward and outward way, and Sierpinski's triangle being infinite in an inward way. And since they converge on the same shape, I think that if we are to truly respect the infinitude of these objects, it's fair to say that a color-coded version of Pascal's triangle in Mod 2 is Sierpinski's triangle. Now, all of these patterns emerged related to even and odd numbers in Mod 2. So what if we looked at modular arithmetic in a different mod, like Mod 3 that contains three VIN numbers and two types of THROD numbers? Well, if I put Pascal's triangle in mod 3 on a grid and put all the things congruent to zero, which are the three VIN ones, as white empty cells, and I put all the ones congruent to one or two, which are the thrawed ones, as black filled in cells, here is the pattern that we approach as we go deeper down that triangle. This time, it's not quite Sierpinski's triangle, but it's another similar-looking triangular fractal that's a bit different. And in fact, there's sort of an infinite family of similar triangular fractals that emerge from Pascal's triangle analyzed in different 
mods. I'll probably create some approximations of the shapes you get in other mods on my bonus Demotro channel sometime, but for now, all the graphics in this episode already took me a long time. I hope you folks enjoyed them. And that's about all for today's combo class lesson. I hope you learned some interesting things with me. And special thanks to the people who helped make this show possible, such as my Patreon supporters. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll catch you again in our next episode soon.